and uh, it's great to be great to be here. Um, thank you, Tom and and uh, Megan for having me. Um, this is a, a a really opportune time to to talk about uh, technologies to fight COVID because I think as we have seen the the virus is really going through a uh, a resurgence in many parts of the globe and I think uh, leveraging all the tools that we have uh, to combat uh, the spread of COVID-19 is, is really important, uh, especially on a global context. So as Anna said, um, I direct the Global M Health Initiative here at Johns Hopkins. Uh, we're in our 10th year of operation and I have faculty from across all five divisions of uh, the university, engineering, public health, nursing, medicine, and so forth. Um, over the years, we've supported students and faculty in really understanding how to use digital technologies in research, monitoring, and especially the evaluation of technology innovations in uh, low resource settings with a focus on strengthening health systems. We've served as a center of excellence for WHO and other partners in the development ecosystem. So it's really a pleasure to share uh, work that comes from that entire ecosystem, um, trying to uh, give you guys a taste of uh, how technologies are being used in the global setting. So I always like to start this talk by uh, giving us a recap of, uh, of where we are in the pandemic. And this is a snapshot of the uh, coronavirus.jhu.edu uh, portal that uh, many of you are hopefully familiar with um, that, that tracks the coronavirus uh, cases and deaths across the globe. And as you can see here, as of yesterday, we've uh, passed the 10 million cases mark. Um, of course, this is likely an underestimate given the, the quality of data from a lot of countries around the world. But uh, it's quite sobering that we hit the half a million deaths mark, if at least half a million deaths, if not more um, around the globe. So, so it's important to think about what we're doing and how we act. But I also like to start showing this, this graph because that's the reason that we have a Center for Digital Health and why we're talking about digital health in the field of uh, global development. You can see here between, 20, uh, between 2000 and 2016, this is the, the way in which uh, countries of the world expanded based on the availability and penetration of mobile devices within those countries. And what you can see is how Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia really explode as, um, with relation to their size and populations um, in terms of places where um, mobile penetration and availability have really increased, which speaks to the fact that we really be, need to be thinking about how do we use technology to fight COVID-19? And the, the premise that we have more connectivity, that is to say more human beings, more, more cell phone connections on this planet than we have human beings on the earth. And that's, that's a reality that we have to take advantage of. Um, to fight the pandemic, whether it's for sharing information or actively pursuing cases and contacts, as I'm going to describe in the following slides. So early in the pandemic, we uh, released an article with colleagues in Bangladesh to talk about a few uh, strategies that could be used to control uh, COVID-19 using technology. And this article is available in the JMIR Public Health Surveillance, and you're welcome to uh, download it. It's available for free online. Um, where we talked about the, the role of, uh, of digital health as, a, as an adjunct for telemedicine, for remote training, um, helplines, as, as many of you have experienced uh, in, in your respective countries and localities, um, and everything from mental health support to case reporting. And so uh, happy to, to share this, and, and I'm sure the Center for Global Health can make it uh, available to each of you. We've also started teaching a course uh, as of yesterday and uh, led by uh, Dr. Agarwal in the Department of International Health, where this is really the, the, the breadth of uh, different use cases that uh, we'll be working through in this course. Um, but you can see how it's uh, substantially expanded from um, uh, research use of uh, technologies for groups to keep in touch with their cohorts during uh, lockdowns and quarantines to um, the reporting of uh, whether cases are remaining quarantined and, and, and isolated and uh, tracking the route of people as they travel through their daily, uh, daily lives 
um, to check for potential exposures and uh, interactions with others. So today, because of the, the limited amount of time that we have and the fact that you know, we, we are teaching this topic across an entire uh, summer course, um, I'll be focusing on just a few domains and, and hopefully this will give you a, a good flavor of the, the wide realm of things. Um, and so without uh, further ado, let's dive in and talk a little bit about uh, the first of these, which is um, training in and telemedicine. So the dream of telemedicine is not novel, and, and these uh, cover illustrations from the 1920s uh, illustrate how, how but way back then, uh, a, good, a good hundred years ago, people were imagining a future where sick patients and clinicians from a, a, a vast distance could interact with their, with their uh, providers and, uh, and perform remote diagnostics. And, and in this very prescient uh, image on the right, uh, you can see uh, a clinician uh, palpating his patient with a remote joystick, uh, something that anyone who's used a Da Vinci uh, knows has, has come uh, well into, into reality. But uh, this has clearly been something in, in the minds of, of folks. But as many of you also know, the reality of telemedicine on the ground has been uh, fairly stunted. And there's been a number of reasons why, especially in the U.S., that telemedicine hasn't taken off to the extent that it could, a, a, a major part of this being um, legislative and regulatory hurdles that, that uh, providers had to go through in order to be able to deliver care remotely. Now, during the pandemic, the Health and Human Services arm of uh, the government, uh, the Office of the National Coordinator for Health IT, issued what is called an enforcement discretion allowing providers to use a range of technologies to interact with patients during um, the pandemic uh, using platforms that may not meet the stringent criteria of HIPAA uh, patient protections that uh, is usually required. And so that really opened up the, the proverbial floodgates we were hoping uh, for wider adoption of, uh, of telemedicine, uh, at least in the U.S. Now, has this worked? Uh, yes, uh, telemedicine adoption over the first two months of the pandemic here in the U.S. Uh, saw adoption or intention to adopt go up uh, at least 22 percent, according to this uh, survey by Civic Science. And so has it been a revolutionary change in the landscape of, uh, of clinical service provision? Not so much, but uh, we're, we're hopefully sowing the seeds to demonstrate that there is public uh, interest in telemedicine. And as many of you who may have experienced this during the, the, the pandemic, uh, you recognize that uh, it does make services more accessible, especially for benign follow-up visits, where the hurdles and the costs of, uh, of traveling to and waiting for a face-to-face -face interaction are sometimes sufficient to keep people away from uh, the hospital because of loss of job time or the costs incurred. Now, when you think about in, uh, in many countries around the world, in Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia, uh, software like WhatsApp is commonly used by clinicians to interact with their patients, to exchange information between clinicians, and even to receive lab test results. So whether telemedicine is formally being used or not, I think we have to recognize that there's a strong demand among providers and, and uh, patients for this kind of digital service. And so I think, you know, just uh, yesterday there was, a, there was a, a webinar looking at how um, uh, virtual care is really, is really booming and training people on how to use these various channels to engage with uh, other clinicians and with patients. Um, and even HHS has launched uh, uh, educational websites which talk about uh, not just the HIPAA flexibility but also um, how billing and reimbursement works uh, using telemedicine because I think that's been one of the, the puzzling parts about this. Clinicians are afraid that, uh, that their time will not be remunerated um, and excessively uh, taken advantage of uh, on digital channels, and which is something to consider and, and also to uh, protect. But the other part of the, uh, 
the the two-edged sword that I think where it deserves mention is um, how technology, especially in the spread of information, has really been a challenge during uh, during this pandemic. And and well before this is a paper from about uh, five years ago by colleagues uh, Mark Dredzi and his team um, in the School of Engineering, and um, uh, and with uh, David uh, Bonatowski. Um, where, where they really illustrated how, and I, I was looking for a, a good picture of, a, of an evil bot, and I think I, I found one here. Um, but the, the conclusion was that, that there was an active campaign of dis and misinformation being waged against uh, vaccines, <clears throat> largely promoted by these automated uh, agents, as well as human uh, quote unquote trolls, that is to say people who who actively spread uh, misinformation and sow discord as a way of eroding public confidence in health systems and in confidence around uh, vaccines. And so many of these messages that people were receiving were actually sourced to a small number of these uh, M malevolent agents. And so well before the coronavirus uh, pandemic began, this information war was actively going on. And here we go into the pandemic. Back in February, uh, uh, Dr. Tedros, the, the DG of uh, WHO, released a, an article um, where he was quoted calling the uh, pandemic an infodemic. So defining this particular COVID-19 pandemic as not only a fight against an unseen pathogen, but a fight against the, the rapid spread of misinformation and intentional disinformation. So, so that infodemic is running parallel to the pandemic and something that those of us working in digital health and in, um, in health communications um, and, and even mainline uh, clinicians who, are, who should have been focusing the 100% of their time on combating the, the virus were, were found themselves dealing with um, a, lot of, uh, a lot of effort <clears throat> targeted at correcting misinformation in the media and helping to guide the, the public uh, appropriately. So I'm sure many of you have experienced this in your own uh, professional careers. And so what you can see here, Wikipedia even recently launched an entire page documenting uh, uh, the entire library of, uh, of misinformation and disinformation spreading through digital channels, uh, social media and uh, online networks uh, that have been very, very difficult to uh, combat. And so here's a it's, a, it's a fantastic list that's constantly being added to, um, ranging from miracle cures um, all the way to, as, as many of you may have heard, the, the, the embedding of microchips within the vaccine, which if uh, you stay with us till the end, I will share some, some fairly disturbing um, statistics that have just come out of a survey we've launched uh, in the last two weeks. And so the reasons for the, the rapid spread and uh, I would say absorption of this misinformation ranges from uh, lack of media literacy all the way through to lack of uh, fact-checking skills and poor legislation. And in this, in this particular window, I'm focusing on Southeast Asian countries um, where legislation to uh, combat misinformation is, uh, is sparse. So WHO and others have launched uh, online websites and uh, bots within popular channels like Facebook to help fight uh, false information. And here's an example of the WHO chatbot that anyone on WhatsApp can access, as well as Facebook Messenger and other mobile channels, um, as well as other fact-checking networks that exist regionally and nationally. I know in India, there's a number of these local WhatsApp fact-checking networks that can be um, asked whether a particular uh, piece of information is true or false. And you can see here number four, the Mythbusters channel focuses particularly on uh, that, uh, that angle. So uh, in addition to fighting misinformation, you can also see that these channels help to spread information, correct information on the latest numbers in the pandemic, how to protect yourself, and then answering frequent, frequent questions 
that are posed by the, the general public. So the fact that almost every human being on the planet has either in possession or access to a mobile device really, I think, uh, has not gone unrecognized by uh, public health authorities and normative agencies like WHO. So here at Hopkins, uh, Dr. Agarwal and colleagues at the, uh, at the D Department of Computer Science at, at uh, the Johns Hopkins uh, undergrad campus have been looking at uh, enhancing a informational chatbot. So the one that uh, WHO has as a starting point, but uh, making it more conversational and being more flexible to questions that are asked by users using natural language. And through um, technologies that are empowered by artificial intelligence and machine learning, they've been able to continue to build out a massive repository that can uh, emulate that, that real conversational experience that makes people more comfortable speaking to a, a bot than uh, just having a few dozen predefined questions going into that uh, encounter. Now, one of the things that, that folks often ask is, you know, how do we fight this uh, tsunami of misinformation? And uh, colleagues here in the Department of International Health, uh, Rupali LeMay and Brian Wall, uh, have led a lot of work uh, looking into this. And uh, one strategy that they've proposed is, is to go back to um, fundamental communications uh, uh, theory, <clears throat> one of which is the, the idea of uh, inoculation, borrowing from the field of vaccinations. Um, this looks at building resilience in the general public against misinformation, much like a vaccine would build resilience against future pathogen exposure um, by providing people the, the intellectual, the cognitive tools to fight their future encounters with disinformation. And that's not by overwhelming them with positive information, but using two-sided messaging to, to preempt the possible negative information that they would receive about uh, the vaccine being a, a source that of, uh, of autism or uh, containing microchips and laying out the reasons why that information is likely not to be true. And so, you know, preempting the kinds of uh, misinformation and helping people arm themselves against that when they do encounter it in their social media discourse. So we've also been working on that. We've had over uh, 70 students across the university working to build content uh, to, fight, to help with that inoculation. And so if you would, uh, uh, early form of COVID-19 vaccine based in, uh, in the information space. Uh, on YouTube, we've had over um, now 100 videos in, in more than 45 languages. Uh, and for those of you who are international uh, audience, I strongly uh, encourage you to please go to this link at the bottom, uh, tinyurl.com, J-H-U in caps with the small letters COVIDio. Find the language that you speak and uh, help spread this information through, you, through your networks and thus further inoculate people against misinformation, um, which is really critical to help us fight uh, this, uh, this virus. WHO has helped with this by, by launching uh, online free courses, and this is available through the Open WHO website. And so uh, a lot of information for uh, uh, clinicians and public health uh, professionals from how to, how to don and, and doff a PPE, uh, to hand washing and other procedures that, uh, again, can be learned um, online. And this is also open to uh, the general public uh, for, for their edification. So moving on now to symptom screening and, and mitigation, let's <coughs> first take a look at some of these uh, chatbot trackers. And uh, hopefully many of you will have uh, experienced a chatbot when you visited a government uh, website or one of the WHO or, or other normative agency websites, uh, usually a, a, a small window pops up asking whether you would like to ask any questions. And as you can see here, this first screens you for um, any life-threatening symptoms and then goes into actually capturing symptoms consistent with COVID-like illness, um, providing you information about how to get tested 
and whether you should seek uh, medical care emer immediately based on emergency uh, symptoms. But as we look at the landscape of technologies for surveillance and prevention and diagnosis, we, we found that the list is a never ending one. And at the last count, there were 143 solutions on this online repository that's being maintained by uh, colleagues in the digital health space. From Pakistan to Kenya, uh, local companies are developing solutions. Um, telecom companies are, are putting out uh, solutions and uh, well-established digital health groups are also putting out uh, solutions. So uh, there's a lot of opportunities to uh, explore these with uh, local entrepreneurs who, are, who have developed solutions and also to leverage work that's been done in other countries to strengthen work in your particular uh, geography. So, so please, if there's one thing I will beg you is do not reinvent the wheel. Do not start from scratch. There is already a lot of source materials out there that can be leveraged to accelerate the work that you're doing as opposed to um, throwing away resources to starting things from uh, scratch. Um, we're currently at the center uh, engaged in a process of doing a, a formal evaluation of the top nine of these solutions that you see represented here on the screen. And we'll be using a combination of systematic and uh, test-based approaches to evaluate these various platforms. And so you see here illustrated on the left, um, DHIS2, a very popular platform that, um, that has a COVID offering for surveillance and screening and contact tracing. And so that's what this looks like on the left. And then uh, others like ComCare, that's also in use widely around the world, have developed a series of modules as well that allow public health authorities to mount a response. So, so we hope this report will be launched next week, um, thanks to the Gates Foundation, and uh, will be available widely for your consumption. Now, many of you are probably very interested in the space of digital contact tracing. And so without going into much depth about what is contact tracing, I hope the media has done a good job of, uh, of preparing folks to, to really understand what this means and how this is a, a linchpin of, uh, of our, our fight back against uh, COVID. The, the premise is to be able to rapidly identify um, test positive individuals or putative cases and then rapidly uh, elicit the list of their potential contacts and quarantine them or get them tested as well so that we can prevent the further propagation of this virus through our human networks. And so the faster we can identify cases and their contacts and, and prevent those contacts from spreading the virus further, the faster we can prevent the continued transmission of this virus through a population. And so the question has always been, since the beginning of this pandemic, is how do we leverage the fact that all of us have phones or smartphones in our pockets in many of the countries where the pandemic is raging to rapidly detect and expedite this process shown uh, up top um, to prevent the sort of the, the, the tedious and slow uh, human process that this, uh, that this takes. So many countries, and here's an example of Singapore, uh, that ha have launched programs that, that are officially sanctioned by the Ministry of Health um, to equip citizens with a standard um, vetted and secure platform that allows uh, people to uh, rapidly inform their contacts um, known contacts and unknown contacts, people they may have been sitting next to at a restaurant or standing in line uh, behind uh, waiting for a subway ticket. And so the, the goal was to, to uh, encourage citizens across the country to download these applications and, and then uh, help secure uh, the population as a whole. Now, a lot of concerns have been raised around how does this... Um, how does this compromise privacy and security of individual uh, information? Where I've been, who I've been in contact with. There may be uh, issues with my, my not wanting uh, government authorities knowing um, where I've been or, or what I've been doing. And so this sort of mistrust 
has, has I think, compromised to some extent the widespread adoption of these technologies in many countries around the world. Singapore initially um, hit about 20-25% adoption before plateauing and having to undergo a much more uh, vigorous process of sensitization and enrollment. And I think they've now uh, hit a healthy proportion of their population um, downloading and using uh, this technology. The same is true in Scandinavia, in India, around the world, and this is another page from, uh, from Wikipedia where they have listed all of the country level solutions that have been launched um, from Japan to Jordan to Qatar and Hungary, um, apps that countries have launched to help uh, secure, uh, to, to help with contact tracing and case identification. So if you're interested, feel free to go and look at this list and see how technology is being used in your particular um, geography. In some parts of the world, uh, governments have been able to make this mandatory as part of uh, uh, you know, more, I would say, more um, authoritarian governments, governments that have the capacity to implement laws around uh, the need to leverage technology during a, a public health crises or security crises. And so some countries have insisted that um, incoming travelers install these applications on their phone where their period of self-quarantine is, is digitally enforced. So in Kuwait, when you land in, uh, in the airport, you are asked to download an application that ensures that you are um, at your hotel and not traveling around the city um, during your period of quarantine until you have been uh, proven to be uh, COVID free. And so in other parts of Southeast Asia, um, if you are found to be a case and you're asked to isolate, if you break your isolation, and so some of you may have seen the word that I used earlier, um, geofencing, um, you are told to stay within your apartment. And if you leave your apartment, the phone alerts the authorities that you are um, exceeding the bounds of uh, that geofence that you have been provided um, and putting others at risk. So I think there's a continuum um, of, uh, of uh, liberty versus public, uh, public good that I think uh, people and countries and societies have had to navigate um, when thinking about how to use these technologies. But how does this work? And I think, I think this illustration from the Google-Apple collaboration is very elegant in, in sharing sort of the principles of this technology. So let's imagine uh, Alice and Bob meet each other for the first time. They both have their phones in their pockets and they're chatting on the bench and, and just having a, a friendly conversation. But while they're conversing, the phones, having noticed that they've been in proximity for at least 15 minutes, exchange an anonymous key, letting the, the phones uh, register that, that key or that signature, just in case in the future, there might be need to uh, take a look at that list of people that Alice and Bob have been in close contact with for an extended period of time. A few days later, here we have an unhappy Bob who has tested COVID positive, and now he uploads this test result. Now, I hope many of you are thinking, aha, there is a flaw in the system because Bob is now required on his own volition to upload his uh, health status to this phone. And as you can imagine, there's many countries where uh, people would be hesitant to do so for fear of, uh, of recrimination or other, other um, you know, government uh, abuse. And so, in this particular scenario, the idea is if Bob uploads his status, then the phone uploads the last 14 days of keys to the cloud where they're stored temporarily. And meanwhile, Alice, who's unaware of uh, the fact that Bob is test positive, she never really knew him well and she just met him for a brief amount of time, but her phone keeps checking the cloud to see whether any of the keys that she has on her phone match the list that is test positive on the cloud. And so in this case, her phone finds a match that, oh, one of the people you met, and she doesn't know that it's Bob, she doesn't know that uh, it was on that park bench, all she knows is that one of the many contacts that she may have had during the past uh, several weeks um, has been found test positive. 
So she gets information about this. She gets alerted that she should go and test herself for, um, for COVID and, uh, and other notifications about what to do next. Now, the big debate here is really around who gets this information. And so many countries are saying the scenario on the right is the one that they want. They want this information to be sent to the cloud, but also to public health authorities, because it's the duty of public health authorities to follow up with those positive cases and contacts to make sure that they know what to do, they know how to get tested, and especially to make sure that they are not experiencing health complications that need uh, clinical support. But many countries have opted for the scenario on the left where um, the information is not shared with public health authorities and the identity of individuals is not divulged to anyone except to let others know that they have been in, in, in proximity to a positive um, case. So a real debate, and you can see this plays out in countries like the US where 50% at this last uh, survey that was conducted in April uh, already have said that they would not use a contact tracing app in the US, even if one were available. And so this level of, of uh, lack of enthusiasm, I think is really important to think about um, when we think about the, the potential for using this technology to combat uh, coronavirus. Recently, uh, the Berman Institute here at Johns Hopkins put out a, a brief textbook about uh, the ethics and governance of digital contact tracing that has a lot of information that I think is extremely valuable. Um, and this is also available for free on the internet. Um, and you can find it on my Twitter profile or uh, if, you just if you just Google um, digital contact tracing uh, and Berman Institute. So that's, that's available uh, online. Now we've also been supporting uh, governments here in Maryland and in other parts of the world to leverage this intake system. So we mentioned the chatbots and other screening tools um, <coughs> to connect patients or, or interested persons in the public to these call centers or automated agents that can triage and refer individuals for care or provide instructions for isolation and testing. And so the technology to create um, SMS or IVR, that is to say interactive voice response, um, press one if you'd like to be connected to this, press two if you'd like to go there, those kinds of systems now can be made very, very inexpensively with technologies that's available widely to anyone here on this webinar today. And so I'd be happy to uh, provide you links to some of those uh, technologies, but this is a standard sort of template for a uh, public health response system that can be created using SMS and IVR and uh, minimum uh, human involvement for COVID uh, management. So let's take a look just briefly at, at, at some of the success stories. And as many of you have seen, South Korea, and this is a post that was just uh, released yesterday um, by the Harvard School of Public Health and uh, Adrian, Adrian in the labs, um, showing how South Korea's lessons learned from the MERS uh, epidemic really was translated into successful uh, response to COVID-19. And here's, here's the, the proof in the pudding, right? To see the case rates going up and then rapidly being brought under control and kept down all the way until uh, this past week. And part of this was they had developed uh, legal and, uh, and governance mechanisms around the use of technology and data for the control of a pandemic situation well prior to COVID-19, allowing for an increased level of trust in, on the part of citizens that when uh, 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 epidemic or pandemic were to occur, the, the government will be able to jump into action and um, use all of the tools at their disposal to try and manage the uh, pandemic. And so you can see here in a, in a snapshot of sort of the way they've used um, data to monitor contacts and, and cases, the, the digital side of this is highlighted in red at the bottom, um, investigating medical records, 
using GPS uh, location information from phones, um, using credit card transaction logs, and digital closed circuit television to identify where people have been, um, who they may have been in contact with, and really shutting down the, the potential for spread uh, very, very rapidly. And so, as you, as surely each of you is thinking right now, um, that requires a level of disclosure and uh, permission to the public health and, and government authorities that in many, many geographies, people would not be comfortable with. And so um, it is a trade-off between uh, comfort and uh, ability to combat uh, this kind of uh, pandemic. And so the bottom line was South Korea is more tolerant of personal data sharing and its success has been heavily dependent on its ability to rapidly scale up technological solutions. And so um, I think that I, I put this up because I, I think that really sums up the, the dilemma that we face in this particular space. Now I'd like to briefly end with a uh, discussion about how digital technologies help us to increase epidemiologic insight during a pandemic. And so from clustering to movement to adherence to non-pharmacologic interventions, um, we've been able to use mobile phone data to give us a lot of insight into how this pandemic is evolving. And so as we know, even across the US, the epidemic is a very heterogeneous one. The intensity of the epidemic has varied in time and space, um, but we've also seen a very sobering uh, story of a grave inequities between uh, minority groups' experience of uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, especially in low SES and African American and Native American populations, who really borne the brunt of not just infections, but also uh, deaths in, in this particular uh, country. And so using mobile phones, whether it's through surveys, asking people questions, or actually looking at where these phones are moving across a country, within a community, um, moving outside of the home or staying at home, all of these things can be proxied um, by uh, using uh, mobile phones to capture this, uh, this information. So I hope all of you realize that the phone companies um, are, are able to capture a lot of information about where you are at any given time of the day, how long you spend at a particular location. This is known as a, as a dwell time, right? So you can see here, these parameters are, are measurable. You can look at where people are going and you can even distinguish as shown here in green and red, when people are outdoors and when people are indoors based on signal strength. And this information can, is often made available anonymously um, without identifiers to marketing uh, companies looking to strengthen uh, the sale of products and services to person, persons who own cell phones. So um, whether it's Starbucks who is trying to figure out where to place their next um, cafe or uh, folks who are trying to market uh, advertising to people coming out of a basketball game um, and seeing where, where, which of the locations they go to immediately after a sporting event. In this case, and you see here illustrated on the right, um, mobile phone movement was used to do document the, the change in mobility starting in early March to early April, um, experienced by the US public once uh, lockdowns were implemented in, middle, in the middle of March. And so you can see here from red to blue, indicating blue indicating the smallest amount of movement, we're able to use cell phone data to proxy the movement of individuals um, during the pandemic. And you can see sort of the variability in which states were slow or which counties were slowest to adopt a uh, high level of, uh, of decreased mobility. I ran this analysis just a few days ago, um, testing the, 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 a new technology that we've been given access to called Cubic, where we're able to look at this data over time. And so March 15th is when um, more or less national lockdown orders were issued at each state. And you can see here that it's, it's really, the malls were closed at that time. And you can see the data reflects very elegantly that sudden drop in mobility reflected by cell phone movement 
gradually increasing as malls begin to reopen around the country. And so this data really is, is exciting. And companies like Google have made this available to the public and to research groups to uh, analyze at no cost. And so if you go to go Google Mobility, you can find this data made available. And here's an example of Brazil where um, the daily mobility patterns across these different uh, domains are, are articulated over time. And so if you're interested in this kind of analysis, uh, feel free to look at Google Mobility data and you can download the raw data and include this in your analysis. But I think this also reveals to us a more sobering trend. And so if you remember this slide that I just showed you um, with the sharp decrease in movement around March 15th, in the United States, this also revealed uh, a much more uh, disturbing and un unsettling story of how staying at home during coronavirus, it was really a luxury, affordable really to those uh, wealthiest segments of the community and um, not evenly available to all persons in, uh, in the community. And so two things that you see here, one is that the, the adoption of sheltering at home among the poorest segment of communities shown in orange compared to the wealthiest segment of communities shown in, sorry, shown in blue uh, is a delay of about five days comparing when the, the wealthiest people were able to decrease their movement by 50% and the poorest people were able to decrease their movement by 50%. But then if you look here, you'll see that even during the, the April period of the pandemic, the poorest segment of the population was either not able or, or um, not aware of, of the shelter in place uh, capacity, but most, most likely they were involved in essential work or um, necessary work to, to maintain their incomes uh, to uh, be able to shelter in place. And you see that inequity uh, drawn out in cities across the United States, including uh, here in Baltimore, where Johns Hopkins is located. And so looking at this at a national scale, we see here's another analysis I just did um, a few days ago, looking at uh, mobility trends and staying at home. And you see that not only socioeconomic status, but looking, let me just, um, oh, I can't annotate this, but uh, if you see my mouse, you can see here, this dip in mobility where you see people beginning to move a lot more. This was the last Memorial Day uh, holiday in the US where for about seven days, we saw about a 10% increase in mobility, even though the virus hadn't changed in its, uh, in its patterns of transmission. And uh, many of us are concerned that starting tomorrow, we're going to be seeing the same uh, increase in mobility and in human interaction proxied by mobile phones during the July 4th uh, holiday. And so um, something to be concerned about. But <clears throat> we've also been able to see differential trends in adoption of these non-pharmacologic interventions. And I think this is a really elegant piece of work done by our colleagues at the University of Maryland uh, Transportation Institute, where if we look at, you know, high level of social distancing, good, right, to keep people held in a healthy distance apart during uh, this high peak transmission period, and red being low levels of social distancing. If we look at the pre-pandemic period in early, late February and early March, we see that across the United States, as one would expect, low levels of, of social distancing during the week when people are moving about as uh, expected. Now, I'm not going to go into how they calculated this index, but it's, it's largely bringing in a lot of mobile phone data to the, the, the table. And so what you can see here, as I mentioned earlier, March 15th was when the shelter in place orders went into effect. And across the board, there was a, about a, a one day um, peak in uh, social distancing that went back to nor quasi normal for the week. But you can see these these cubes are a little less bright red than these cubes, showing that a reasonable number of people uh, tried to follow these guidelines. But this got more and more blue as time progressed and as states began to um, implement official stay-at-home orders, as indicated by the Xs. So this transition from, from active community movement 
to sheltering in place um, is nicely reflected by this, uh, this mobile phone data. But you can also see here at the bottom how a number of states didn't quite turn as blue as uh, the states on the top of the graph. And so whether it's for political reasons or societal, uh, social reasons, uh, hard to say at this point, but clearly heterogeneity in how well um, people in these states adhered to uh, these, uh, these guidelines. But you can also see what uh, our colleagues at Maryland were, were defining as quarantine fatigue, where you begin to see uh, a rapid degradation of the blueness of these quadrants into this light pink uh, color and uh, bright red, even uh, as we are going into partial reopening. And so uh, the level of patience of populations is really something to, uh, to consider. The other interesting analysis that I think was linked to mobile phone uh, data tracking was around uh, the spread of coronavirus during um, the early February spring break that many universities uh, allowed their students to experience during that period. So in this case, our colleagues at uh, Tectonics basically drew uh, a quadrant around people who were on a beach in Florida during the spring break and then followed those phones as they returned home at the end of spring break. And what you can see based on the phone-based uh, data how far this group of people from a beach in Florida spread across the eastern seaboard well into some of the Midwestern um, states, showing how these sort of small groups of people can act rapidly spread uh, throughout an entire country, um, taking the virus with them. The other thing we've also observed using cell phone data is um, what, what some might like to call the flight of the wealthy. And so, uh, Early on in the pandemic, there was, and the New York Times just reported on this uh, a few days ago, uh, a widespread exodus from New York, which was a hotspot of the, the pandemic, across the country to the east, to the west coast, and to Florida, um, this time going in the opposite direction from those kids on the beach in spring break. And um, this is also corroborated by mail forwarding requests um, from New York City showing a sharp doubling and then tripling of uh, these, these people who are away from home during the, the height of the, the pandemic in February and March. And so the sobering data was that about 5% of New York left between March 1st and May 1st, almost half a million people fleeing from this hotspot of uh, the pandemic. Now, what's also sobering is that where this flight was happening was, of course, from the wealthiest parts of Manhattan and um, parts of New York where, where really the, the residents were able to move because of their socioeconomic status. And multiple types of cell phone-based data have corroborated this movement uh, pattern, um, showing how this uh, cell phone data is remarkably consistent. So, our colleague at Tulane had a very nice uh, quote, you know, it's a tried and true human strategy that when you encounter trouble, you run away. And uh, I know Tom is a, is a big fan of uh, public health history. And so as many of us are, and this goes back to uh, the black death of the, the 1600s, where we see here the wealthy um, burghers of the, of the town of London fully trying to flee um, but the, the villagers meeting them with, uh, with angry weapons saying, you know, go back to London. <laughs> so, so this is not a new phenomenon, and unfortunately, very, very rooted in, in human nature. So right now we're in the process of, uh, of trying to tackle and understand this, uh, this challenge of the inequity of coronavirus in, uh, these po in the U.S. population and, uh, and broadly around the world. But the concern of uh, disproportionate mortality in African American and Native American and Hispanic populations is something uh, that, that has really uncovered long-standing inequities in uh, this population that, uh, that has only now manifested uh, and been, been emphasized by the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. We're engaged in three work streams. One is following an existing cohort the other is deploying a series of rapid surveys across the US, as well as some geospatial analysis of population movement. 
And then finally, uh, an analysis of, uh, of policy interventions across the globe, um, as I, I uh, shared with you earlier, but we'll make these links available to, uh, to the audience uh, in, in the near future. Um, the survey is consisting of a demographic module and modules around these various um, areas of knowledge, attitudes, and practices. And right now we're focusing on the US, but we're also planning to expand this uh, survey to a global footprint. Um, and just to share very, very briefly, here's just a couple of slides on, on what things are looking like uh, from just the first week of data. And so you were able to see, uh, this is about uh, uh, 1,200 responses from largely the Maryland uh, state. And I just wanted to tease you with this very sobering statistic that um, with these responses so far, when we break down the responses of willingness to get a vaccine when it is available, you can see a very stark uh, differential between white and Hispanic populations' willingness to get the vaccine and the response of African American uh, in, involved in the survey, um, about a 20% differential and, and a lack of willingness with um, green and, and orange indicating extremely not willing or not willing, um, suggesting this continuation of what we've known for, for quite some time of uh, historic mistrust and uh, loss of confidence in the health system um, when it comes to uh, the historic treatment of these minorities in, um, in American history. So on that sobering note, um, I hope I've given you a, a good landscape of, uh, of the range of tools that uh, we've used during this, uh, this pandemic and, and hopefully given you a little bit of inspiration for uh, ways in which you can use these tools uh, moving forward. Great, thank you so much for that very comprehensive presentation, Alain. Uh, in our last eight minutes or so, I've got maybe three really big, really tough questions uh, to just, you know, I'll just zip them at you. The first one is, um, in your presentation, you described minimal enthusiasm in the United States for some technologies, including telemedicine and contact tracing apps. Is there any data pointing to the acceptability of these technologies in other countries, particularly LMICs? And if so, is it any different? Yeah, absolutely. And so I hope uh, the example that I gave of, uh, of um, South Korea mm -hmm. is one that, that is reflected in, in Singapore, in parts of China, in, uh, in, other, in, in Sri Lanka. Uh, I think there's a continuum of individualism to collectivism that countries fall on. And I think the further towards the individualism uh, love, end of the scale uh, societies fall on, the, the less likely they may be to adopt uh, these technologies because of the high level of mistrust in data stewardship, data security, and uh, preservation of individual rights. Um, I think it's a combination of collective thinking as well as government authority to be able to impose uh, the use of these technologies or strongly encourage the use of these technologies. I know Australia, I mean not Australia, New Zealand also launched this kind of technology and had a fairly decent uh, level of uptake. Um, but also, you know, they're a very collectivist society, but yet they encountered resistance when it came to um, universal adoption of that, that, uh, that technology. So I think, you know, it certainly has the potential to be used to enforce isolation and quarantine in countries where that's legally permitted and where there are protections on the individual. Um, but in terms of using the technology for contact tracing, it's we need to do better as societies to build um, st governance structures that give the public confidence that their data is going to be secure that their data will not be able to be used for nefarious or other surveillance purposes, um, and that it will be, you know, somehow stewarded in a way that protects them and is only used for public health uh, purposes. So, so there's a bit of homework that has to be done beforehand, and hopefully this time we can we can do those things so that the next pandemic um, will be ready. 
All right, I'll ask the next question, but before that, you might want to stop sharing your screen or else we get to see your beautiful calendar uh, for all of your activities for today and this week. Uh, Leah Suganda asks, and this is a really a follow up on thinking about um, protection of data, but how do you protect personal data to avoid discrimination, particularly in LMICs where you haven't put legal or regulations in place? So you talk about homework, but anything, you know, what else can, or uh, what it's other a, considerations? It's a very, very good question. And I think there is um, um, GDPR is the framework that, that was launched by the European Union uh, uh, several months ago that is being increasingly adopted globally as a framework to protect uh, uh, data that is enforced by, by punitive uh, measures and in and uh, legal enforcement um but there are across you know many countries in sub-saharan africa and south asia a uh, growing digital architecture that includes um digital health policies data protection policies um that so the policies may exist mm -hmm. i think the 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 question is asking about you know, a, 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 a challenge that goes well beyond the, the realm of, of our ability in the technolo technology space to, to, to deal with, and that's, you know, governance issues. So, so how do you reduce corruption and abuse of authority? And, and you know, that, that has to be dealt with at a, at a much higher level of governance than, than, um, than, you know, what you can do at a policy level. But, but interestingly, because GDPR applies globally to residents of the EU traveling outside, countries um, that, 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 that capture and use data from EU citizens are subjected to the GDPR laws and, so, um, and can be sued, et cetera. And so I think that's, that legal recourse has, has increased um, adherence because of, uh, because of the financial component. All right, and our last question, uh, which I think is very relevant to a number of participants on the call, how do we ensure interoperability of these digital tools in LMICs and specifically in Africa? And then how might we leverage these digital solutions for other health conditions? And that comes from Janine Uimana. Great question. Interoperability is, is a very, very important uh, aspect of uh, this technology. And as I mentioned very early in the talk, um, one of my, my pet peeves is, uh, is wheel reinvention. And so um, I think we, we, we hate to see technologies that are, that are basically duplicating work that others have done. And so it's important to be able to have access to open source technologies. But there are, over the past five years, there, there are a number of standards that have emerged, including um, HL7 Fire, um, FHIR that um, that have made interoperability much easier um, if the developers building the software adhere to those standards during the development of those uh, platforms. And so I will put in the chat box um, a link to a, a group called Digital Square that is um, hosted by by Path and funded by a number of organizations that has helped to build um, what are called global goods. And these global goods are uh, resources that are available to the global digital health community, um, developers and implementers alike, to try and maximize uh, interoperability um, of technologies. I think that that's a really important, um, important question. Well, thank you so much for spending this hour with us. Thanks for, to our participants for joining. This was a really great, very informative session. So thank you, Alain. Um, as a reminder for all of you who have been with us for, uh, for the seminar series, we're moving to Thursdays only. So our next session will be next Thursday at 9.30 and we'll be joined by Dr. Yuga Manabe. So, um, and quick reminder, please, to fill out the, uh, the evaluation form before you go, and that link is in the chat box. So thank you again, Alain. This was a fantastic session. Really glad that you could join us, and um, thanks, everyone, again for joining.